Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 14th of December 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance and it is here. Great to have you on the stream and uh, very interesting conversation tonight. I've got um, Victor and Steve Q to come in in just a second. But just before I do that, I'm going to put up my normal little notice just reminding everybody that we don't give financial legal advice on the show. This is just a general conversation. The chat is moderated. Please play nice this is as at the 14th of december if you're watching in replay if you'd like to ask a question then use at walk the world to make sure that you get my attention uh, that's the best way to get uh, it highlighted in in my chat dialogue i can't promise that all questions that will be asked will be answered but we'll give it a good go and also I've enabled super chat so if you'd like to make a contribution to what we do here um, feel free to use the super chat or indeed get your question to the top of the list um, I've said a few times we don't do this to make money, we do this because we care about, care about the issues. So that's uh, what I'm going to say there. And now without further ado, let me push the button here. Victor, I think you're there first. Hello, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, very good. Good to have you on the uh, stream again. And uh, uh, it seems like only yesterday that we were already doing this, but there were so many questions that you volunteered to come back on again. Tremendous time. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great. It was great fun last time. So very happy to be back. Thank you for having right. us. Right. And Steve, uh, you're there too? Not too bad, mate. I'm suffering from actually having my, my burst yesterday. <laughs> but they're looking, I'm nodding off. It's because I'm dying and turning into a 5G tower. <laughs> yes, OK. <laughs> Any excuse. But you're back in Sydney now. Yeah, actually, I'm in Engadine right now. So uh, staying here with my sister, I've come out to get to do all the... Uh, necessary procedures to re-enroll as a voter, so which is a prerequisite for um, being a candidate in the next election for the Senate for the New Liberals. Great, okay. Well, now I've got a whole bunch of questions. Um, uh, Victor, I think the first one is for you. Um, mm. This is from Max. And the question that he actually asked was this, you know, there are two main parties and then there are a few you know, other parties, but there are lots of minor parties that are popping up. The question is, what does this proliferation of minor parties tell us about what's going on at the moment? Oh, I think there's, there's uh, undoubtedly a lot of uh, uh, concern about trust, the trustworthiness of the, um, of the, of the two major parties. Um, I mean, I was out uh, letterbox dropping today and you know, every time I meet somebody in the garden and I tell them about our party and how it's like a real Liberal Party that, you know, um, tries to engage in aspects of justice and compassion and equality of opportunity, they nod like mad because, because uh, and this is in a, you know, a so-called blue ribbon Liberal seat, they nod like mad because people are very dissatisfied uh, with, the, with the duopoly, as we call it now, um, and so we as a party are a natural reaction to that, but there are other parties and there's also a, a slew of independents uh, popping up across the country trying to um, use the playbook of um, Kathy McGowan, who won in Indi, and uh, Zali Stegel, who won against Tony Abbott in Warringa. So, yeah, all those uh, alternatives are a function of the dissatisfaction with the major parties and the lack of trust of the major parties. And the major parties know this very well, and uh, we may have talked about this before, but they introduced legislation designed to try and um, eliminate uh, a lot of those small and emerging parties. They're now trying to introduce legislation to stymie the independence on their funding issues. I won't go into the details of all that, but, um, yeah, it, it just, it, you know, it's a real battle. It's a battle... It's not a battle between Labor and Liberal anymore at all. It's a, it's a battle between the duopoly and uh, a whole range of other people and parties and independents who are seeking to reintroduce some sort of sanity into our political system. I think it's also it's a global phenomenon too when you look at it because there are people dissatisfied with the Tories in the UK, of course, with the, the duopoly in America. And... A lot of this, I think, is just a sign of what happens with the structure of the political system. It wasn't a given that you'd get corrupt behaviour uh, out of the actual parties themselves, but their funding is driven by large donors. Uh, their, their brand structure means small interest groups, like, for example, let's just take one at random, Pentecostal religious people can take over a party and totally change its nature. And so lots of people are coming in and seeing the product of that being disgusting. We're coming and seeing we need to change the system to make sure that can't happen in future. 
Right, and so that's a inter very interesting observation there about changing the system, right? Because quite often what happens is that um, the small parties end up with a little bit of, um, you know, influence, but they sort of t horse trade it and get little benefits mm. and you know, small movements, um, but not necessarily more radical reform. What's the recipe that you guys have got to try and make sure that some of the reform ideas that you've been talking about really can stick? Well, I guess our, our recipe is that we hope to hold the balance of power. Um, and if we do, we will unashamedly blackmail the major parties into uh, reforming donations law, getting rid of media monopolies, doing something on climate change, introducing a real federal uh, independent commission against corruption with teeth. Um, if they want our cooperation, that's what they'll have to do. Uh, but, you know, the, the next parliament won't be like any other parliament that's ever been seen before in this country, but what sort of parliament will it be like? If it's just us holding the balance of power, I think we can predict that we'll do just what we said. But there are others that are, that are knocking at various doors, and we could quite literally, I was trying to do the numbers today, and it's quite possible that there could be, there's already... Um, for independents and a Greens in the lower house, um, it's quite possible there could be 10 independents, four Greens and three new Liberals. So you've got about a cross bench of 17. Now, how that would work, uh, I really don't know. One can make some predictions about the proclivities of the current independents and, um, and uh, the Greens. Uh, because, you know, they, they've, they've shown their stripes and they have published policies. And you can make predictions about us uh, from what we say and from our very detailed public, published policies. Uh, but the independents don't have policies as such. Um, they work on a totally different system. So it's impossible to know really who they are, what they do, um, and what that would do to the balance of power and the, the, the ability to hold government to account. So it's, uh, it's all before us. It's going to be quite, a, quite an interesting future. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, as I've said before, it's good that we can have these sorts of conversations on this sort of channel. It's a pity that the mainstream media is not actually having similar conversations, right? Because it's almost like the, the mainstream stories are being somewhat emasculated and the real issues that, and policy issues that you guys are talking about aren't getting much of an airing on the mainstream. No, they're not, they're not really getting, getting an airing at all. Um, and it's, it's kind of frightening in a way. I, I had a tip-off that Morrison was, um, had instructed the press gallery that if they reported on us, then they would find it very difficult to get cooperation from uh, the ministers and would possibly be excluded from the cabinet briefings. Um, now, that was just a tip off and uh, I really, you know, can't say how reliable that is, but the proof of the pudding seems to have been, uh, if you go on Twitter, for example, um, some journalist will say, oh, our next show tomorrow morning will be about X, Y, Z, and like two, three, four hundred people get on and say, well, why isn't it, you know, why isn't it about the new Liberals? Why aren't you having the new Liberals on? Now, that's a pretty heavy pressure on, on those journals. It happens two, three times every day to that quantity. Um, and particularly when they say they're going to have on Barnaby Joyce again or one of the, um, you know, fringe rat bag like George Christensen or one of these people yet again, um, that the, the, our followers on Twitter go absolutely insane. Um, and I, I think they, they're not just getting pressure from Twitter, they're getting pressure from everywhere, but we're not getting interviewed. So it tends to confirm what my tip-off was. Still not evidence, but, it, you know, the, the, the likelihood seems to be building over time as we get more and more traction. Um, and, you know, even on your show, Martin, you know, I think we broke the, the record for, for viewers last time. And so that's happening to us all over the alternative media. Um, uh, I mean, with Steve Keen uh, now as our number one Senate candidate, uh, he and, and sometimes I, I join him, I get interviewed all over the world, um, but not by the Australian mainstream media. So 
I don't know. I don't know how long they can hold out on that, but uh, it, it is a very interesting discussion we need to have about that. Mm. Well, it just seems to me that um, we're getting a very sort of strangulated set of discussions in the mainstream, and unfortunately some of those sort of big policy issues and some of the why questions, you know, why are things the way they are, don't really get... I'll give you an example, right? It, it, and this is a question I got earlier on. Do politicians lie? If they do, why? And why doesn't the media call them out? <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to have a go, Steve? I mean, <laughs> oh God! I mean, it's often because they're trying to control the narrative. And so, if you give a genuine answer to a question, you might lose control of the narrative itself, and you're trying to dominate it. They treat the media like a public relations organ of their parties, rather than an actual third estate. And to some extent, the decline in the quality of the media in the last forty years, mainly because the media didn't, it never worked out how to adapt to the internet and never learn how to go from the biophysical copy of a paper to subscribing in any sensible way. It's reduced the calibre of journalism, it's reduced the amount of time they have, and they've now fallen into, we've got to fill spaces in a digital page, uh, we'll just reproduce you know, Scott Morrison's latest uh, puff piece as a news story. Um, and then if they get told, we're well, going to cut you off from the, the puff pieces if you talk to the new Liberals, then you get a truncation of the debate because they don't know what to put in there otherwise. So um, I, I used to, you know, when I was a, 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 a doing my PhD, uh, one of my pleasures was sitting down and reading Alan Ramsey in the Sydney Morning Herald on a Saturday, reading his column. Now, there really is nobody who does analysis like Alan does today. And the, the, the funding just isn't there to support the critical media we need. So we're basically fighting not just political corruption, but also an inherent corruption of the, the media system too. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, getting back to the core of that question too, Martin, about do they lie and why do they lie? I mean, mm. do they lie? Yes, is the, that's the simple answer and everyone knows that. Why do they lie? I think it's because, first of all, they start off wanting to please everyone. So you, you, might, you might have... So I feel this pressure when I'm talking to individual voters and groups of people. Um, so you might have a very complex, nuanced policy um, and someone at a town hall meeting will ask you a question a, a, about that and you really get a sense of what they want to hear. And it's sometimes quite easy to tell a kind of half-truth by, I mean, I do hope I resist this, but, but there is a temptation to tell a half-truth by taking out the nuance, you know, and just um, leaning it to one way. And then when you're at the next meeting and the next person asks the question, leaning it the other way. Um, and I suspect that that, not a, that becomes a kind of way of life until they kind of forget where the truth is. Uh, and I think there's another dimension beyond that where they get addicted to lying. I actually believe that Scott Morrison is addicted to lying. I think even when he doesn't need to lie, he still does because he feels that he's lied so much that he feels safer when he's lying than when he's telling the truth, you know? So I, I, that's just my own personal psychoanalytic um, answer there, but I, I, I think there's some truth in that. They also want to seem to be like they're in control of everything too. That can't be forgotten. And they're not experts. They're, they're generalists. And one of the reasons why we're doing what we are now is that the type of people who get attracted to politics, a bit like what Groucho Marx used to say, he'd never belonged to a club that had had him as a member. Well, what you've got is people who actually want to be prime minister. And they're the last ones you should let take the job on. So you get an institutional corruption with narcissists running for power. And what we've seen is narcissists have got power. And narcissists never want to, cannot admit it to mistake. If you ever had any relationship of any sort with a narcissist, the last thing they can do is admit they made a mistake. And if you answer a question truthfully, you're admitting you've made a mistake. And that goes against the grain completely. Uh, you have to have a certain ego to get involved in something like this. Martin and I are not, uh, Victor and I aren't claiming we haven't got egos. But we're not narcissists. And if we make a mistake, we're going to be terribly sorry we made a mistake. And I've seen Victor put quite a few of those tweets out over time. Uh, and that's going to be a practice we try, and I've done the same. We're trying to maintain honesty. And I think, and, and that's really the fact that the political system selects a narcissist. 
I think is a major reason why we're in the state we are now. And one of the things we have to do as a party over time is work out how we avoid the same thing happening in our own internal selection processes. Yeah, very good. So um, I guess that takes us to the sort of the, the nub of it, right, which is that there is a narrative that we want people to understand is different from the one that is being propagated by the mainstream parties, which is, you know, treating people as sheep, telling them very simplistic things, um, playing perhaps also to the, um, the, the hip nerve pocket of the, uh, you know, of the wallet. Um, mm. And it goes back to a sort of slightly more philosophical question, which is what is politics about in the first place? And, and you know, it, what, what are we really trying to achieve as a society and as a community? And how does that play in then to the political system and the economic system that supports it? Yeah, I, I, I think there's no doubt. Uh, this, happens in mo this happens in most professions. So I can, I can say as a barrister that... Um, the, the, the system demands certain things of you and, and some people come in uh, and they, they don't have those things in their armoury, but they learn them and they adapt to them. Um, and I think it's the same in politics. Uh, people come in, no doubt, with a, a variety of motivations. Some probably just want to make their fortune doing grubby deals, but others come in, I think, with high ideals. But the system tends to crush it out of them, and I, I would, I would, I would guess there's hardly a politic. Certainly, in the two major parties, there wouldn't be a person uh, in politics who remembers anymore why they did it. Um, when you see some of the the deals that the Labor Party does, you know, I mean, I could talk about a lot of things that they've supported the government on. Um, but you just take a simple one like this is supposed to be the party of the people and they support the government on tax tax breaks for the wealthy. Now, uh, I, I imagine that most Labor politicians came into the Labor Party with some level of desire to help the working person. It's the Labor Party, after all. Um, but, but you have no evidence of any resistance from any members of the Labor Party to doing those sort of deals with the government or any level of regret on the part of the members of the Labor Party. And I think that's because they've forgotten why they went in there. Uh, and the clinging to power has become the game in itself. That's, that's a big thing. I think it's tribalism. And in this sense, it's, again, dominate politics around the world. So you end up supporting your tribe and then you do what is necessary for your tribe to win rather than the other side. I can see it with Michelle Cash's behaviour. I mean, God almighty, the, the sort of Rottweiler look she'll get in her face when she's attacking the other side of Parliament. It's the same sort of thing I saw in student politics when I was a, a student at Sydney University. I was not on the SRC. I refused to stand for the SRC, but I'd see this attacking the other side, this tribalism, is ingrained into them. And if you do that for 40 years, your first principle is not the truth. It's not even what your uh, principle is supposed to be. It's no. making sure your tribe wins. Yep. Sorry, Martin. I've... You've gone quiet, Martin. Uh, sorry, sorry my apologies. That was, that was my... I muted myself. There was a <laughs> bit of background noise here and then forgot to unmute myself. Uh, I, I said um, that, of course, suggests sometimes that the real agenda is just to win the next election. Yeah. Yes, it, it, I think that's very true. The whole agenda is, yeah, is, to, yeah. win, is to win the next so election. So say anything, do anything, commit to anything, bribe anybody, metaphorically or literally, pork barrel wherever you can just to get back yes. into power. Yeah. That's right. And, huh? and the, and, oh, sorry, Steve, but I was just going to say the tribalism that, that Steve's talking about um, isn't just amongst the members of parliament, it, it's amongst their supporters. You know, Trump famously said, I could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot someone dead and my supporters would still support me. Um, and that the tribalism of those who support the two major parties is much like that. So the Labor Party can do all sorts of terrible things that are against its, its principles, but, but their rusted-ons, as we call them, uh, will find a way to justify that. And... But the interesting thing in Australian politics is that the rusted-ons are, are, are slowly peeling off. I mean, more than more than 30% of people 
didn't vote uh, for one of the major parties last time. And that's really quite a significant number. Um, and that's just definitely going to go up this time. We could have we could have 50 percent voting for people other than the candidates for the major parties. So it's a slow process, but but I think we're at a time now where it's almost uh, we've hit that critical mass. Um, and the, as I say, the traction that we're getting, the independents are getting, the Greens are getting, um, really shows that we've come to the end of the decadent Roman Empire, if you like. It's starting to crumble. Right. And uh, remember what happened at the end of the Roman Empire, right? It was, it was a pretty dirty, horrible <laughs> sort of state of yeah. affairs for quite a long period of time, right? Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was saying to people today that, um, you know, because a lot of, a lot of, I mean, the, the, the Liberal Party has been attacking us from uh, many different sides, uh, you know, passing legislation to try and eliminate us with the help of the Labor Party, things like that. And, and, a, and a lot of people have been, you know, contacting me and getting on Twitter and so on and saying, getting, expressing their anger at that. And I said, you know, we're, uh, we're, the, we're the barbarians knocking at the gates of Rome. We've come to sack Rome. So, yes, they've been nasty to us, but you can't expect the Romans not to fight back. But, uh, you know, remember what happened. Rome got sacked, you know. Um, in both senses of the word, uh, I think the, the Liberal government may get sacked. Yeah, very good. Well, let's move the conversation forward a little bit. There's a lot of economic questions coming in the chat and some uh, beforehand as well. Um, uh, Steve, th there's quite a lot of people who say, look, MMT, you know, good in theory, but surely that's going to actually uh, drive rates higher. And, um, you know, is it, is it really going to be the platform to create the policy changes that you want? So can we just unpack MMT a little bit and uh, put it in the context of, for example, what's been happening in the US? Because there, of course, we've now got inflation and what, and what have you going. Mm -hmm. and, and why is it that public debt isn't the same as private debt? Yeah, it, it comes down fundamentally to accounting. And as you know, I've built a software package called Minsky, which is designed around double entry bookkeeping to show how the financial flows occur in a modern economy. And when you uh, look at it through the eyes of accounting, money is fundamentally the liabilities of the banking sector. So there's some money which is cash, but most money these days is what's in the deposit accounts of the banking sector. And that means, therefore, to create money, you've got to add something to the liabilities without removing from the liabilities at the same time. So, for example, if, uh, you know, Vic pay for dinner on Saturday night, so if I, uh, you know, so I'm going to shout him back and I'll, I'll pay him, you know, a, a couple of hundred bucks, which is silly, but let's use an example. My account goes down by 200, which is a negative. His goes up by 200, a positive. They cancel each other out. So paying money from one non-bank to another doesn't create money. To create money, you've got to do something which is one action on the asset side as well as an action on the liability side. Now, for banks, for private banks, it's finally got through the thick skulls of mainstream economists that they won't actually do anything about it, that banks create money when they create deposits when they loan. So if you borrow money to buy some over, overpriced house in, in Wollongong, uh, you, the, the bank says, here's a million dollars, which they put an entry in your bank account, and you then pay that to the vendor. Uh, and they say, you owe us a million dollars, which is an asset of the banking sector. So banks create money by increasing the, the, the loans of the banking sector as an asset and the liabilities. The government, on the other hand, pays money into people's private bank accounts. So that's increasing when government spending comes, that's increasing what's in private private uh, bank accounts. So that's creating money. And on the other side, they put reserves in the banking sector. So the government creates money by running a deficit. It doesn't borrow from you. It actually creates money. Now, when it does that, if, if for example, the government runs a deficit of a you know, let's say a trillion dollars, nice round number, uh, then it puts a trillion dollars additional money into people's private bank accounts and a trillion dollars into the reserve accounts of the private banks. Now, when the government then issues bonds, uh, what's going on is the, the bonds are a, an offer to the banking sector to use the excess reserves, that trillion dollars of reserves they now have, to buy an asset which actually earns a rate of interest. And it also is an asset you can buy and sell. You can't buy and sell reserves. So uh, bonds are a way of converting non-income earning uh, assets on the banking sector created by a government deficit into income earning assets 
and assets you can trade, get capital gains and so on, which is a major part of how the financial system actually functions. So uh, there, there is no sense in which the government is borrowing money from the private sector to spend. The government is spending and creating money in the private sector and then changing how it's financed on the asset side of the banking sector by effectively swapping reserves for bonds. So there, there's no, if, if the central bank uh, decided to allow the government to run an overdraft, at, and this is not the central bank's decision, it would be a, a parliamentary decision to enable that, then the, gov, the Treasury could simply run up a negative uh, deposit account at the, Fed, the, at the central bank, and that would be what was financing the deficit. There would be no need to create the bonds. Uh, but a, a large part of, of why the government prefers to create those bonds actually goes back to the role of the banking sector back when it was the, the servant of the industrial system rather than the master. And there used to be an old saying, the banking is the 363, uh, a 363 business. You borrow at three, you, you lend at six, and you're on the golf course by 3 p.m. And, and the reason they could do that is they were getting a large amount of money on the interest for government bonds, which was created by the government running a deficit. They didn't need to create all the debt to get us into speculation and so on. And frankly, that was a better time. That was a better way the world ran. So MMT simply acknowledges the accounting realities of how money is created. And then says, in that situation, the government doesn't really have anything like it can call debt. Uh, it, it creates financial assets, which are, which are bonds, which are classified as debt, but then nothing like if you issued a bond, if you had a Martin North bond and you got money from people, you'd have to be earning income out of your business to service that. And if you didn't earn the interest, you'd go bankrupt. It's a very, very different system for a government which creates its own currency. So MMT is an acknowledgement of that. And it's only part of what we're talking about. There's a lot more as well about how you develop an industrial economy, uh, how you give yourself resilience for such a crisis like COVID. Uh, this is no longer hypothetical, this is real. Um, so there, there's a role for government spending. The government should normally be running a deficit. And then when you look at what's happening right now with the inflation, that really is a breakdown of the entire manufacturing and supply chain. Uh, it is not the usual demand pull inflation they talk about. It's cost push by the breakdown of the ridiculously long global supply chains we have, uh, which have been created by you know, major American corporations largely to minimise their wage costs. But they are incredibly fragile, as we're now seeing with COVID. When you knock that off, the whole damn thing falls apart. And of course, it costs more. So people, firms pass those prices on. But you're not, it's not going to be a wage price spiral like we saw back in the 70s, because of course, the, except for things like strategic workers now have got quite a bit of muscle in America. There's no bargaining power for workers. There's no likelihood of a sustained increase in wages as a result of increase in prices. I think what we're going to see is actually a lot of commodities that used to be standard purchases by working class people will no longer be affordable. And that's a sign of the breakdown of the production system. It's nothing to do with MMT. You're, you're muted again, Martin. Sorry, yeah, sorry. There's a lot of noise um, upstairs, so yeah. I have to just yeah, uh, okay. un unmute myself again. Um, so that's very mm -hmm. interesting, Steve. And there's a couple of observations there. The first is what you're actually saying is that the fact of creating, you know, the, the, the money supply stuff that the banks are, are doing mm -hmm. for the central bank is not necessarily intrinsically inflationary, I think mm -hmm. is what you're saying. And secondly... Yeah, that's right, it's... Yeah, and so I mean, what, what inflation? Inflation is a class struggle thing. Yeah. Uh, Neoclassicals argue inflation is a monetary phenomenon. This is Milton Friedman's mantra. Mm. His own data disproves that. Yep. That's with the shonky, shonky bloody data made up to hold an ideological point, uh, and and that's become the basis of mainstream economic speaking. So if you have poor little children, you know, like Malcolm Turnbull and uh, Tony Abbott, and I uh, did, did Morrison actually go to university? I'm not sure. Anyway, they have a university system. They learn economics 101. They learn the textbook. And the textbook talk ticks this whole thing the government has to borrow from the private sector to spend. You can find that in ManQ and all the first year textbooks. It's bad accounting. It's just nonsense. Uh, but that's what they learn. And therefore, they think, they're, they think they're doing the right thing by trying to restrain government spending. And what that means is we don't have a local facility to create vaccines. We don't make our own trains. We buy once from overseas that have cracks. Uh, we end up running down the economy. And because the government's not creating enough money for the growth of the economy over time, the banking sector fills the hole and we have a Ponzi scheme. So we want to get a balanced relationship where the, the government provides the, the large scale infrastructural spending 
which is the sort of thing you need. That would include, for example, funding political parties, so you could no longer have private funding anymore to get away from the corruption of political parties by uh, their large donors. Um, but the, the private sector uh, banks would be there to fund entrepreneurial activity and working capital for corporations, not to fund Ponzi schemes and bricks and mortar, which is what they've been doing. Right. And um, the, the point there, of course, is you can create this, this pool of, of money through you know, that, that process that we've talked about, but it does also beg the question, what do you do with the money that you, you've actually generated, right? Because you could, for example, as um, Frydenberg did, hand it to people who didn't really need it, corporations that didn't really need it through COVID, right? And you can throw it at other areas in the economy and not actually make any fundamental difference to the way the economy works. Or if you put it into the right areas, you can actually fundamentally change the nature and the shape of the economy. That's right. I mean, a large part of taxation, taxation doesn't fund government spending. Taxation decides who hangs on the money created by the government. And what you have out of the capacity of the wealthy to evade taxes for the government spending, which has to be counted to some degree by taxation, because government spending is about 30 percent of GDP every year. Uh, uh, the money gets taken out of the pockets of the working class and the middle class rather than taken out of the pockets of the wealthy. Um, and, and so what we need to do is say we need to change the tax system in such a way that the wealthy can't avoid taxes. Uh, and then have the money when you pay it out, when the government creates the money, it should be accumulating in the pockets of the working class and middle class, not in the hands of the ultra wealthy. They've got the, they should be making their money pri privately anyway, thanks very much, rather than dipping into government largesse. But a large part of it has been they've gone the government largesse route. And once they've got it, because they can be the donors to the political parties, you get this horrible corruption that applies, particularly in the UK. It's probably worse in the UK than it is here. Uh, but you know, there are things like in the UK, I think there were £500 billion pound contracts handed out to uh, companies for producing uh, apps to manage COVID. And the company had been around for about six weeks and had a capital of 3,000 quid. And it was all just you know, handing money to your Tory donors. So... Um, that that corruption has been what's happened out of this so-called being careful and husbanding uh, the, the taxpayers' money. It's actually led to even yet more corruption of the political system. Right, and that goes back to the fundamental decisions that people take. Sorry, uh, Victor, you want to come in? Oh, I just want to add one thing to what Steve was saying. There was a point where he said we need to also change the system to make sure that um, major corporations can't avoid tax. I think it needs to be pointed out uh, that we don't need to change the system. We have this pr probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, anti-avoidance tax systems in the world. Uh, they avoid tax not because we don't have the law to prevent it, but because the governments of both persuasions refuse to enforce the law. It's, it's, it's no different from having a uh, a, a criminal statute that says, you know, thou shalt not murder. And when somebody murders somebody, you say, oh, yeah, but we're not going to actually do anything about that. You know, the laws are there. The government just won't use them and won't enforce them. And the directives to the, the, the commissioner of taxation, I don't know what the behind the scenes directives are, but, the, but, the, but what you see is, is, you know, small businesses and individuals being, um, pursued like animals for sixpence here and a shilling there uh, when they could use the same laws um, to get the, the, you know, the $40 billion a year that's being avoided by the major corporations. Right, and that comes back to the point, fundamental point about the decisions that are taken or not taken right, are fundamentally important. So, you know, this isn't like this clockwork machine is just wound up and off it goes on its own, right? There are no. decisions being taken, and every time you make a decision, it can be you know, for the people, against the people, for the corporates, against the corporates, right? And it's that logic that's driving a lot of the decision that's actually being taken. So we've got to ask the questions about that underlying logic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the problems that I've discovered talking to the average voter is that very few, well, that's probably not quite right, but a large number of, of people that go to the polls and cast their vote in this country and probably everywhere else in the world, they don't actually see a link between the political decision-making process and the day-to-day -day impacts on their lives. Um, 
I, I don't know what they actually think. Maybe they don't think at all about it. But but <laughs> I, the, the upshot is that they see politics as something where, you know, people fight so they get the right to ponce about as call themselves prime minister. But the, and and then if if I'm out of work or I have to work in the gig economy or, or you know, there's 3.2 million people below the poverty line. Well, that's just bad luck, isn't it? Gee, it's, it's so much worse. We're so much more unlucky than our forebears were who didn't have to put up with that. They don't see that those things are a direct consequence of a whole range of political decisions. Mm. And, and, and the, the politicians trade on that. They know that they can, as Steve says, they know that they can feather bed their, their donor mates and people won't make the connection between the two. Right, and that comes right back to the question then of accountability, right? Because there, re there really isn't any, is there? No, no. There's, there's, well, the accountability in Australia is, is this, and this goes back to why parties like ours and other parties and the independents are arising, the accountability is zero. I mean, when I was a young man, there were two forms of accountability that the government had to deal with. One was the opposition, uh, if they tried to do something dodgy, the opposition would be screaming across uh, the table at them in in Parliament, uh, and and the media would be would be hounding them uh, for answers. Now neither of those happen anymore. There is no uh, functional opposition, uh, and there is a very tame media, so there is no accountability now. You know. The best of people are going to, when given absolute power like that, are going to run with it, you know, let alone the worst of people. Uh, but <laughs> hence, hence the Roman Empire um, analogy that I made before. Absolutely. Yes, absolute power corrupts and you know, all that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Now, um, Steve, there's a question from last show from Smooth Operator, which is what I'll put up on the screen here because it's quite a complicated <coughs> one, but controlling interest rates, you know, 5 40% or in line with capital gains, would this approach keep property from being an investment class, reducing speculation and stabilising prices and help savers forming a deposit? So trying to actually take out the capital growth out of property. What do you think about that? Um, no, I, I don't think it's enough to do the job. And this is... Uh, like I was, this, I'm going over Harman Minsky's work going back 30 or 40 years. And Minsky's point was you can't control the economy using interest rates alone because what really controls people's willingness to invest or speculate are their expectations of financial gain. And if you expect, for example, that you're going to see a 20 or 30% increase in property prices in one year, then you're going to swallow a 15% rate of interest uh, because you think you're still going to be coming out substantially ahead. So interest rates alone don't work as a control because the main thing controlling it is your expectations of profit. Um, so what you have to do is address that side of things and say, we don't want you to profit out of property speculation anymore. Um, property speculation is, is, the, is the least creative way to become a billionaire and it's the most effective way to become one in Australia. So we have to stop that. We want to stop property speculation being the driving factor in the economy and have banks lending a real investment rather than lending for speculation. Now, the large part of that is we have to reduce the level of private debt right now because we have the second highest level of private debt in the world and the highest level of private debt by far of any country running a trade deficit, which we normally do. So um, the, we just have to reduce the level of household debt, and that's one of our policies to do so, and bring house prices down as a direct consequence of that while also ensuring that people don't lose the, uh, the equity they have in their housing. We want the, the banking sector to shrink, not people's equity. And I think that observation that the interest rate lever is insufficient to achieve the transformational change that's required is a really important mm. insight. Right? Because, because, Keynes had the same thing back yeah. in the 30s. It's actually quite fascinating. Keynes, yeah. if you read his, uh, people want to get an idea what Keynes is like, don't bother reading the general theory of the book. It's pretty bad in my opinion. Uh, read a short paper called The General Theory of Employment you can find on the web for free. And that's a 22-page summary of Keynes of his main ideas. And what he said there fundamentally is that interest rates don't control investment. Expectations of future profit do. And, and, uh, and then what happened with uh, the neoclassicals, with John Hicks playing a leading role, they simply misinterpreted the whole thing as a supply and demand mechanism and they had to argue, therefore, that the interest rate controls the demand for money. And that nonsense 
has been around for 90 years, it's probably 80 years, it's been wrong for 80 years, but that's still the way the mainstream think. And that, again, is the danger of electing people who've done a first-year economics degree. But that also begs the question, then, central banks, because central banks are pulling the interest rate lever. So what... Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I mean, they should be pulling this... What they should be pulling is the ethical constraints on banking, because it, 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 how does a bank become a bank? Simple. It raises a large amount of money, signs a whole lot of government forms, uh, meets some ethical standards, and then it gets a license to create money. And then at that point, you treat them like they're the masters of the bloody universe. No, they have a government-created license which they should be using for socially uh, decent objectives. But once they've got that, they've, then they've got the crowd of power to create money, and with that power, they can corrupt, corrupt the political system. And that's what we've seen happening worldwide. So I want to constrain the power of bankers. People like that out there, my father... Uh, could have been a major figure in the Reserve Bank. He got the choice of going to the Reserve or the Central Bank when the Commonwealth Bank was both the People's Bank and the and the Government's Bank. And uh, Dad used to say that in the in the 50s, if the Governor at the Central Bank told the uh, chiefs of the, of the private banks to jump out the window, they'd ask which floor. He said 10 years later, the uh, the bank, the chiefs of the private banks were telling the Central Bank Governor which window to jump out of. So I want to reverse that power structure and get uh, get it seeing banking as a public uh, uh, right, which has public, public responsibilities, and the banking sector will be there to build the economy rather than build Ponzi schemes. So does that mean a public bank of some sort then? Yeah, I'd be very happy. I'd say it would be me immense pleasure to renationalise the Commonwealth Bank, OK? <laughs> it's, not, it's not our policy, I mean, it's my own personal preference. But the whole idea of privatisation, and remember Labor began this, uh, rather than Liberals. Uh, but privatising Qantas, privatising uh, the, the Commonwealth Bank, privatising electricity, uh, all this stuff was done as a neoliberal idea that the private sector does things so much better than the public sector. Now, there are some things the private sector that definitely does better, uh, but that's not everything, and it certainly isn't major infrastructural uh, for things like the general provision of money and provision of, of basic services like you know, water and sewerage and, and power. So we have to reverse that ideology saying the private sector does everything better. What we see ultimately, of course, of that is even more corruption in the political system because those then private owners of what used to be public assets end up controlling the politicians by controlling their funding. Yeah, and there's, there's just uh, hundreds of examples, aren't there, Steve? I mean, of, mm. of the horrors that... I mean, <laughs> they privatised the buses in Sydney, right? And... and <laughs> The private company changes the bus route numbers. Well, first of all, they eliminate half the bus routes. So all the useful routes where you could get from your front door to the city, you've got to take three buses now. But, but you know, they change the numbers. So, so you get on a bus that you go to one place and you go to another. I mean, not, not efficient, um, not socially beneficial, nothing. And yeah, I, know that, I, I saw on the news... I saw on the news today that the New South Wales government is looking at privatising the rail system again um, <laughs> because of some of the financial and they've been caught up. And now, of course, state governments are different to federal. They can't create money. They do have financial constraints and so on. And that means they should be better funded by the, by the, by the federal government. But you look in the UK, which is the poster boy for what happened when you privatise the rail system, it's a joke. And the, the, the whole idea was privatise it, you'll get much better investment, much better trains, much cheaper services. The UK has got the worst rail services in Europe, the oldest carriages, the worst timetables, and what's even funnier, most of them are owned by the government corporations of European countries. It's just a <laughs> joke. So you don't, the last thing you want is to privatise fundamental services where the whole idea is to make sure everybody who, who you know, within any reasonable distance of a major population centre can hop on a train and get somewhere else. And that's a cost which, which should be covered by government money creation capability, not by so much by private fees. Uh, you know, in, in that sense, ease of transportation without needing a private vehicle is a sign of a well-managed economy. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I remember in the 80s and 90s working in consulting in a number of different environments, both in uh, the UK and uh, here as well. And the idea of bringing market disciplines of the private sector into, pu mm. into the public to create more efficiency and effectiveness, mm -hmm. right? And internal competition and all those things. Um, there's a fundamental fallacy in that whole philosophy, isn't there, Steve? There is. I mean... Um the, the, the discipline of uh, it, it's a whole myth of this uh, idea of 
uh, you know, competitive uh, economies, competitive markets, so small firms all working efficiently, buying and selling inputs off each other. When you look at the real world, uh, the major corporations are the ones who are, um, uh, have incredible internal cost control and do everything locally, and they're driven by an overall vision. So, you know, I've, I've got to admit to being an Elon Musk fanboy for a whole lot of reasons. <laughs> he produces everything internally. And what you've got is a huge command system. Um, so you, you don't get this idea of the democracy of the market and the buying and selling the mythical vision of first-year economics. It's a much more complex picture than that. And there are some cases where you simply want to provide a service at minimal cost. And the best way to do that is to have the government carrying the can for it. And public transportation is a major form of that, as is public education. Well, there's a long, long list, right, if you start list listing them all out. <laughs> But it comes back to that fundamental question, right? So what sort of society do you want? And, you know, what sort of um, things should be there as part of the, if you like, the furniture of society, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if you bring that sort of market discipline as the, the central platform to everything, then it all sort of just falls apart. And you get all the overhead of a real market economy, which is not in the textbook. So, you know, these, these privatised firms spend all their time competing with each other to market themselves. I experienced this with the University of Western Sydney, which I think is now called Western Sydney University. And one of these days it'll be called the Western University of Sydney, or which I'll abbreviate to WUS. Uh, it's run by a bunch of third-rate third rate, uh, uh, academics who could never get a, a, a real job in the, in the real academy academic sector itself, paying themselves large salaries and wasting huge amount of money on marketing rather than saying, here's a quality barrier, unless you get the bug exam, you can't get into our university. You get in here and you, your fees are paid by the state and you progress if you do well and we're going to set you tough exams. That's the sort of world we should have. So the whole idea of privatising rather than giving discipline in the market has ended up with the corruption of the dollar. Let me move the conversation on just a little, a little bit here. There, there was a a thread of conversation and questions from the previous show and afterwards went along these lines. Um, you know, we've got a climate emergency, well, COP26, mm -hmm. and we've got the COVID thing. And, and, and the question was asked by quite a few people, is there a line of sight between those particular things and corporate greed and, you know, the markets and all of those things? In other words, have we created those monsters because of the economic form that we've actually got running in the in the world at the moment what do you think about that no i think it's very true i mean um, i mean you, you know private corporations are obviously going to be involved in exploitation of mineral resources and so on uh, but then you get a question well who created the minerals resources the answer is nobody they existed there beforehand so again in terms of the husbandry of those that is a public responsibility which should be taken on by the by the government of the day but instead, because of this whole privatisation, I call it private rather than private, because it's a weed, it's not a, it's not a sensible piece of logic. This privatisation philosophy basically says, oh, but Rang Hancock, he, he, just, he, just, he invented these minerals and now he's mining them. No, he didn't. He flew over in a bloody plane and saw them and took out the mining lease. Um, so you should be saying, if you're going to mine that stuff, that comes with responsibilities as well as a source of profit. Uh, now, instead, by making everything uh, privately, uh, you end up with the sort of corruption we've seen. And also, uh, they are fighting tooth and nail to stop these resources being blocked when we know that certainly in case of, of coal, we simply shouldn't be mining it anymore. Uh, we, we have to, as fast as possible, stop pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that is vital. And, of course, private interests that own that and make a profit out of it are going to fight tooth and nail to stop it happening. And what about the COVID thing, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's out there, but do you think there are actually economic drivers that explain why it is we get these sorts of things at this time in our history? Yeah, I mean, well, for a start, one is the fact that there are so many humans now. Uh, you know, any, any young aspiring uh, pathogen is going to choose humans as its host rather than, for example, lions or tigers because we're riding the others to extinction and we're breeding like crazy. So in that sense, we've made ourselves the most exposed species for uh, pathogens to, to develop in and grow. Uh, but the other side of things is, again, to handle things like, a, like a, a pandemic, you have to have spare resources and you have to have uh, ICU beds you're not using uh, as a matter of course, because when, when a pandemic hits, you can use them. You have to have, uh, you know, because most of these diseases are going to be um, um, 
uh, pass on through the air. You want to have filtration systems. You want to have masks that are in stock. I think I told you last time around that when the UK minister asked her experts how many masks you could have in stock, they said a billion. And she thought that was too many, so she had 50 million. As a result of that, the mask supply in the UK ran out in one day because of COVID. Now, in that sense, this is one of those classic areas where you have to have public provision and you do it and you make a loss and you know you've got to make a loss because if you don't make a loss, you'll be just destroyed when the crisis comes along. Finally, we're capable of thinking about that in terms of military defence, which, which is crazy. You know, nobody ever wants any of these bombs and jets or planes to be dropped anywhere. We're happy to finance them nonetheless because we think we're protecting ourselves against other humans. What we need to be doing is protecting ourselves against the damage humans have done to the environment and treating it with the same sacrosanct principles we once applied to defence. But that begs the question, if population is a root cause of the problem, then we have to change our philosophy of population, don't we, to have a chance of tackling it? Ultimately, yes, but the main population that's causing this are the wealthy. So if you look at the uh, proportion of the carbon pumped into the atmosphere, uh, the proportion of the population that's been putting 95% of it into the air at the top 5%. So the first attack, you, you can't decide to knock off 95% of the population, but you could decide to impose the costs of consuming 95% of the carbon on the 5% of the population that actually does it. And that would be a dramatic change in the distribution of income and power to do that. And that is certainly one thing I hope to achieve. Right. And, you know, the point is that if you actually look at the proportion of the resources that a small proportion of the population is using globally, right? They're using about three planets worth, right? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, uh, I, 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 I was a senator on the transportation front. I've flown all over the bloody world giving talks at conferences, and mainly because I think I've got to be, get as many ears as possible about the foolishness of neoliberal economics and now their work on climate change. But, uh, you know, it, I'm not the typical person sitting in the business class in those planes. It's the business executives that the ones who've got their own private jets, et cetera, et cetera. That's the end of the, that's what That's the population we need to control first. So that takes me on to a, an, an angle here which I want to explore, which is the, the, the Davos connection, right? Um, because you've got this global elite, which is sort of connected to um, the World Economic Forum, the OECD, all those other things, and you've got this um, you know, very, very rich elite who seem to me to be sort of calculating a particular set of logic as to what the future looks like. Um, to both of you, what's your attitude to that sort of global top-down elitism and do you think they're part of the problem or part of the solution? Oh, you go, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you coward. Okay. Uh, yeah, you go. I'll jump. They're mainly the problem. Uh, without a rip at Murdoch, I'm never going to turn up a solution to anything. Uh, so uh, the, the, the power that he has, the, the, the power that you know, the media moguls threw around when the media moguls mattered, and Murdoch's about the only one left who does, that's corrupted the whole political system, and they use it to their own advantage. I'm no great fan of Bill Gates, I have to say, uh, in terms of what he's done in both in business and in philanthropy afterwards. So they do control the agenda, and what you need to have is have the majority of the population controlling the agenda. You need Greta Thunberg's at Davos. You don't need Bill Gates. So that and, and having power to do something about it. But what we really see out of that is the incredible power, the incredible diver, uh, 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 disparities in wealth and access that exist these days. And we have to address that. And that's a major reason why our party has come about. We are the little people. Uh, we are people who are disgusted by where politics has become in this country and as part of a global feeling of disgust. We want to get people who have had real lives, real jobs and real experience and have real empathy, getting in there and making the decisions and tearing down this money and power related system which has taken over the world. Yeah, and it's uh, back to the Roman Empire, if I may. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's if you'd even when the Roman Empire was in full decline, if if you'd said to the average person, do um, uh, you think these barbarians are going to stand a chance? They'd say, no, nah, not against the Roman Empire. You know? we've, had, we've had 300 years, 400 years of dominating the world. That's, they're not going to knock it over. And I think people look at that, um, 
global power base, that, that uh, interrelated power base between politics and industry and military and uh, all those things that we know about and think, my goodness, there's no way to overturn that. But there's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a power in six billion people. Uh, and and they're starting to mobilise. It's it's doable. It doesn't. It it may not look doable, um, but it's been done before, and it'll be do, done. It'll be done again. Um, and I think I think sooner than people realise. I think I think the need is is so strong uh, that it's that it's driving people on. So the barbarians are at the gate. Uh, that's my last quote from the Roman Empire. After. <laughs> Oh, there's a, there's a couple more. I like the fact that they put on their um, sideshows to keep, you know, everybody... Um, oh, yes. You know? Bread and circuses. Yeah, yeah, breads and circuses. Well, you know, surely, isn't that what streaming services are all about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, at least they're entertaining. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I've got no time for Morrison as a form of entertainment. <laughs> no, 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 fair enough. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because it occurs to me that some of those people, you know at Davos are actually running their own spaceship companies to be able to actually go and explore other planets, right? It's almost like, well, we've broken this planet, but we'll go and build something somewhere else. It's almost running away. Um, it, it seems to me that this is <laughs> the wrong set of strategies to deal with the fundamental issues that most people are going to have to be confronting. I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to defend uh, uh, Bezos or, or um, what's his name, the, uh, the other English character. But uh, the objective that, that, uh, that Musk has of getting us to be multiplanetary and getting off the planet, I think that's an, a, a vital objective. And it's actually, he's doing what the government itself should have continued doing after the Apollo uh, program. And so this is really one case where a private wealthy person is doing what the government should have continued doing for 50 years. And uh, so there's a failure. The whole neoliberalism has failed to do the nation building and indeed species building stuff that it was started by Kennedy. So um, it's a quirk. It shouldn't be being done by him, but it is. And I'm glad it's being done by someone. OK, interesting. Right. So thank you for that. And uh, look, I, I was old enough. I can remember the, you know, the, the, the moon story and the amazing innovation that came off the back of it and the mm. vision and dream that Kennedy gave. I remember, you know, the, the speech. Um, it is very important, but it just feel to me a little bit sort of fiddling while Rome burns. <laughs> oh, Rome again. There you go. We're back. To, we're back. <laughs> we can't escape. Now, I want to move the conversation on, Victor, to something I want to touch on with you. A number of people asked specifically about the removal of civil liberties and human rights by stealth that we've seen in Australia, in other places around the world, and that isn't just COVID related, but even before COVID. And, and you know, the analogy that some people uh, in the quote uh, in the chat was, was talking about was like the frog in the pan, right? So that you turn the temperature up slowly and the frog doesn't notice until it's cooked. Um, what's your perspective on human rights, civil liberties, and the erosion of, say, to both? Yes. Uh I mean, it's happening on multiple fronts, but if I can just give you one example, which I think makes it very clear. Um, Paul Keating introduced what's known as mandatory detention for asylum seekers. Prior to that, asylum seekers were brought into the country, they were put in comfortable hostels and they were looked after. Um, I'd like to think that Keating brought in mandatory detention because a few of them went wobbling about somewhere and got lost and he thought it might be more convenient um, to hold them uh, against their will for a couple of weeks until their case was processed. I, I hope I'm, uh, you know, not sugarcoating him, uh, but I suspect that's probably what his intention was. Um, that has been extended without the legislation in question uh, changing one little bit from the way Keating introduced it. That's been extended by administrative action and supported by the court system So over time so that you go from, you know, I won't detail every aspect of the, 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 the you know, the temperature going up on the boiling frog, 
But the result was that you started with people coming in and being held against their will. I mean, I don't personally believe anyone should be who's committed no crime should be held uh, within, you know, at the, at the behest of, of any uh, executive decision uh, against their against their will. But you know, it was a relatively minor thing that people decided they could accommodate a couple of weeks in detention while your case was processed. Fast forward um, 30 years, we now have a situation, the latest, the latest part of the situation is that the Liberal Party government introduced legislation uh, which the Labor Party supported uh, that, that purported to be uh, that purported to deal with 26 men who had, uh, who were asylum seekers but had committed crimes, often quite minor crimes for which they got one or two years um, jail, and all of these men had served their sentences, uh, and the legislation was designed to keep them uh, in detention for the rest of their lives. The Labor Party supported this, and the Labor Party supporters um, said, well, it's only 26 lives, so it's worth doing. Labor shouldn't shouldn't really, you know, Labor doesn't want to make a big target of themselves and be shot down in the next leg. It's only 26 lives. First of all, I find it profoundly disgusting that people could sell away 26 lives or even one life for some sort of uh, expedient political gain. But the fact of the matter was it that was just the starting point. The reality is that the, the new legislation now enables the Minister for Immigration in his or her complete discretion to send a proven asylum seeker, that's someone who has established that they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their homeland, can send that person in contravention of uh, the Refugee Convention that we've signed up to, can send that person home to their death. And if their country won't take them, uh, then... Uh, they can be imprisoned, thrown in a dungeon for the rest of their lives. Now, these are people, this includes people and will include people and will be used for these people because when something is available, it gets used. So someone will come to, people will come to this country and they'll put their hand up and say, I'm seeking asylum. Uh, and they'll go through the process and they'll prove themselves to be asylum seekers and at the whim of the Minister for Immigration, they can be sent back to their death or, as I say, if the country won't take them, imprisoned for life. Now, uh, no civilised society will countenance uh, the executive government imprisoning people without proper judicial process, without trial, but Australia now does. And don't tell me that this is going to stop at refugees, you know? And in fact, it hasn't stopped at refugees because the next step was to strip by nationals of their nationality, of their Australian nationality. Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, the next step will be to strip single nationality people of their, you know, Australian citizens and only Australian citizens of their citizenship. And then say, well, what do we do with them now? Well, we can't send them anywhere because they're not citizens of any other country. So we better put them in detention for the rest of their lives too. Um, we are nine-tenths of the way down the path of eliminating the judicial process from this country. Uh, and so long as we have no opposition and no media to call it out, that's what's going to happen. I mean, it's a really, really serious thing. That's just, that's just one part of the degradation of human rights. We now have also journalists being arrested and intimidated. We have secret trials. I mean, one of the fundamentals of the common law system and the system of Westminster democracy is that trials must always be seen by the public. Otherwise, you have a star chamber where things go on behind closed doors and there's nothing anyone can do about it because nothing anyone knows about it. Our, our human rights, and we have no Bill of Rights like every other civilised country in the world that we can pull out and say, hang on, you've got to stop here. This infringes the, the Bill of Rights. We don't have that. So, you know, we are three steps away from, from absolute dictatorship with this. It is, it is a terribly, terribly serious 
matter, which it's very hard to make people understand and is happening. And that's the, the nature of boiling frog, isn't it? That the citizenry doesn't know that they're being boiled because it, it happens over a period of time. And, and I guess um, if you th think back over the, you know, the COVID story over the last couple of years or so, and, uh, you know, the imposition of thou shalt and thou shalt not do this and that, yeah. Um, what's, what's the New Liberals' approach and philosophy with regards to dealing with the COVID thing and, 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 you know, did people overstep or did they do the right amount of control? Was there too much imposition? Was there not? What, what, what's your reading of it? Well, well we've, we've said all along that if proper quarantine facilities had been um, built, and this is getting back to economics again, you know, Building proper quarantine facilities doesn't just help the situation, it also stimulates the economy. That's not a neoclassical point of view. That's a Keynesian point of view. That's an MMT point of view. Um, but the average citizen understands it very well. If there'd been proper quarantine facilities, um, proper uh, systems for, as Steve often talks about, how far down, where is it, Steve? Where are we on the on the the manufacturing ladder, uh, we're down below Gabon or something, aren't we now? I mean, Below Gabon, Senegal, Madagascar. Uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're many, many ranks yeah. below uh, uh, what we think are our peers in the OECD. Yeah. Well, I think once upon a time, if this had happened, we would have built quarantine facilities, we would have manufactured our own vaccines um, and we would have had it very much under control. So the, dis the decision between well do we drive people out of business or do we kill people, wouldn't have been a decision that had to be made. But our policy is that given that we are now in that position, we have to, and I say this with, with great sadness because I, you know, have personal friends um, who are being driven out of business by, by lockdowns and so on, but we have to preference human life um, over profit, if that's the but choice. There, but there shouldn't be a conflict. Um, there shouldn't be a conflict. Uh, long, that's, that's long before I got involved in the uh, New Liberals, when, when this happened, I said, we've got to, the, the government has to create the money to pay people to stay shut. Okay. Yes, exactly. No small business, yeah, no small business should have lost, should have gone to go into business because no restaurant should have folded. They should have been paid to keep their doors shut and do takeaway uh, and, 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 and use, you know, delivery of food, that sort of thing. So we can actually get through this thing and then come out the other side without destroying our entertainment sector, our food sector, our transport sector. It's been the half assed way that's been managed. It's done all that destruction. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is an, a profoundly soluble problem, you know, mm. for the very reasons you say, Steve. And, and, uh, and yet the blockheads that, that run this country and, the, and, and our states don't see don't that. Be, don't be cruel to blocks, Mike. Blocks, there is. blocks play a useful function. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm complimenting them. Yeah. Um, uh, so we've got a. So now we've got a situation where just today in, in New South Wales, um, or no, tomorrow rather, in New South Wales, all restrictions will be taken off, pretty much, apart from maybe in hospitals and a few other uh, situations. So people people can go unvaccinated into into uh, restaurants and so on. Um, the numbers are already climbing. We've got Omicron and whatever Omicron may mean or be, this is the very time that we need to be cautious. But a decision that was made some time ago by the new New South Wales Premier to open up, you know, uh, is going to be sacrosanct. Now, we got up to, what, 600 cases today? 800. Uh, 804. 800 cases. I've been talking to some doctor friends of mine. Months' time, we'll have 20,000. That's just a fact, you know. Now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ain't good, it ain't good. And, and look, just on that, um, there seems to me to be a question of an adult to child relationship between the powers that be and everybody else, or, you know, an adult to adult relationship. In the former, it's you can do this, you can't do that, you can jump this high but not that high, right? Or yeah. an adult to adult relationship gives more personal accountability and responsibility but also more trust to those individuals where were you on that spectrum between the thou shalt's versus the you know the adult persuasion and uh, and accountability 
we kind of got forced because things weren't done the right way and as they should have as steve pointed out we're kind of forced into a an adult child relationship because we we didn't want to see Australia become like America with millions of deaths. You know, well, we wouldn't have millions, I suppose, but we'd have hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, because, because the adult uh, sensibilities have been taken away from the citizen uh, and you find yourself in the middle of a life and death situation, unfortunately, it's the wrong time to go back and say, well, now we'll give you... And how we'll treat you like adults and give you a responsibility. You know, we, we would say, we have said that if we were in power, um, unfortunately, we would, we would, we would preference um, human life over industry. But, but as Steve said, it doesn't have to be either. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not making that clear. Uh, we would say to the government in power, because they, they see it as a dichotomy, that, that you should preference human life over industry. But if we were in power, it wouldn't be necessary because you could, do, you could save lives and stimulate industry by the appropriate amount of government investment. Right, very interesting. Thank you for that. Now, I've got a few last questions. We're at 9.12, so we're already <laughs> running, running well uh, behind where I'd like to have got to in terms of all the questions, but there are three that I'd like to touch on. This one from Cookie Boy Fizz, which I think is a really interesting one. New, what's your New Liberals policy on water? More dam buildings? Increasing population? What's the solution? So, so there's a population question and also a, a resources and you know, water question that, uh, that Cookie's uh, posed. That yeah. I think it's an interesting question. A, yeah, it's a great question, and it's a multi-stage thing. So, again, let's let's say we were in power now. The first thing we would want to do is deproprietize water. It is a shocking system that a Chinese corporation or a Canadian pension fund can own Australian water uh, running across land that they don't own, uh, and that it becomes a commodity to be traded. It, it's like the ultimate proprietization, you know, privatization. It's, it's insanity um, and gives rise, as we've seen, to government corruption where one minister sells water to another minister at twice the price and everybody makes a lovely profit and sends their profits offshore and so forth. Um, it's a terrible, terrible system. So we'd, we'd have to, we would abolish that. The second thing is to deal with the fact that water allocations are not being observed or enforced so that you have a situation where um, Cubby Station, for example, I, mean, I sometimes feel sorry for Cubby Station because they're not the only one, but they're the one that's best known. Um, I don't really feel sorry for them because they're out there in the semi-arid desert regions of the New South Wales-Queensland border trying to grow, or no, successfully growing um, cotton um, it's, you know, when you think that, 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 that uh, the south of, of America is the perfect place to grow cotton because it's warm and wet and so on, the desert is not the place to grow cotton. So in order to grow that cotton, Cubby Station has a dam the size of Sydney Harbour. Now, I mean, when I first heard that, I thought it was apocryphal. Um, and, you know, I checked and checked and I've now spoken to the heads of the, the cotton industry and, yeah, they confirmed that's right a dam the size of Sydney Harbour. Now, if you've ever gotten a tinny and tried to go around Sydney Harbour, you know, at its periphery, it takes you weeks. Now, the result of that is that they have, that comes about because they have taken clearly far more than their share in the extreme out of the Murray-Darling system, which means that the downstream towns, um, the, the, the Riverina area can't get enough water for its sort of cropping, um, some of which is also... Uh, perhaps a little inappropriate, um, but um, uh, and 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 so people are th literally thirsty. They have to truck in water to, to towns like Dubbo and Wagga and so on. Um, and these towns can't then support the population they've got, let alone any other population. So you've got to stop that. That's the second thing you've got to stop. But the third thing that you you want to do is try and create. Um, uh, uh, once you've solved those problems, you're still back, you've still only got yourself back to, to ground zero where you've got the driest continent on, on Earth. 
But there is amazing technology now for desalination. Um, and, and, and people in, in government and, and in industry and farming know that that technology is there. Uh, but they dismiss it because they say, oh, yes, but who could afford, who could afford to pump that to the areas where it's needed? Um, well, you know, a government that practices Keynesian economics and sees that as not only a service to the community, but, but uh, a massive way in which to, to stimulate the economy when you're creating it and a massive way to stimulate the economy when you've suddenly got water to do what you want to do. You turn a state like New South Wales much more into a, um, uh, you know, a fertile, not a fertile crescent, I suppose, but a, but a, a much more fertile place. Then, uh, and only then, can you afford to um, increase the population. And you would do that, uh, hopefully, by uh, finding, by creating industries that will, and, and housing prices and so on, that will seduce city dwellers out there so that the congestion in the major cities is reduced. Sorry, long-winded, long-winded answer, but, but it is a very complex question. It needs to be a, a addressed in all those stages and in that order, I think. And also in terms of the population and the, and the state of our um, continent, I remember uh, during one of the major droughts, Bob Carr made, being, being an American expert as he is, made an observation that the, the total flow of all the rivers in Australia is equivalent to 2% of the flow of the Mississippi. So we, we see ourselves being the same area as America and think we can sort yeah. point the same population. We simply don't have the water resources. So no. we, I, I would, we haven't discussed this yet as a policy for the party, but I'm certainly in favour of saying we need less people in Australia, not more. And the emphasis upon massive migration intake as a way of growing the economy is simply wrong-headed. And we therefore reduce oh, I, that demand on water in that sense over time as well. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, that's, yeah, as you say, that's not formal policy, but it's often discussed. Um, and I think we all agree that that massive and inappropriate migration to service uh, uh, endless growth is a bad way to proceed. What I find as a as a, as a barrister and, an, and a refugee barrister, what I find ironic, or it's more than ironic, it's tragic, in the current mm -hmm. situation is that uh, whilst well, with the current government and the previous Labor governments and so on, that whilst um, large numbers of people are brought in that probably we can't sustain and probably can't um, offer, often can not offer um, much to the Australian community other than taking up the next apartment in the next high-rise building that's built. Um, uh, and whilst that's happening, uh, uh, the government is spending around $8 billion a year to keep every refugee it possibly can out of the country. So, there, you know, I think uh, the tiny number of refugees compared to the, uh, the number of other immigrants that come in is totally out of balance. Um, and I think we just want to reverse that. We want to have a close look at what we can sustain until we pull off some, some long-term miracles in terms of desalination and water pumping and so forth and um, other, other forms of uh, increasing the, the water table and so on. Um, we, want, we want to look carefully at the level of migration um, in that regard, but we want to show a little compassion to the relatively tiny number of people whose lives depend on us showing them um, some compassion and asylum. Well, yeah. yeah. There's certainly a huge um, drive from a number of uh, entities in power at the moment for a big Australia, right? Significant yeah. increase in migration, because basically that's the only growth engine that we've got. That if you look at pro yes. productivity on a per capita basis has been dropping rather than growing. But if you mm. look at the top line numbers, because you've got more people than superficially, it looks OK. Um, now, you know, to sort of recap what you both said, that is a problematic point of view, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's government abrogating its duty, saying we've got no imagination, we've got no creativity, we've got no knowledge of economics, we're locked into the sort of stupidity that, uh, that neoclassical economics offers us, which Steve so brilliantly um, dissects. So because we don't know anything, we'll just bring in a whole bunch of people and that should, that should help us, that should fix us, you know. And we don't care, we don't care if, if, if it takes you three hours to commute from 
one suburb to the next in the major cities, you know, or that the pollution is dreadful or that, you know, uh, suburbs like where I live in Crow's Nest are now overshadowed by huge tower blocks that, that don't need to be there. Yeah, it's, it's bad, <laughs> bad news. I, one day we'll find something nice to say about this government, but not just yet. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got two questions I want to cover off towards the end, both big areas. But the first one is the debt jubilee, Steve, which, mm -hmm. of course, is a very important uh, policy platform. Um, and you've been developing that in your book and, and everything else. There were two mm -hmm. parts to it. The first part of it was, is a debt jubilee equitable, particularly when those who effectively have been more prudent won't necessarily get the same benefit. Is there a moral hazard that we've we've created by effectively letting people off the debt leash? Well, that's exactly why I call it a modern debt jubilee, because the idea of a modern debt jubilee is to use the government's money creation capacity to cancel credit created money and replace it with fiat created money. So everybody, whether you borrowed money or not, gets exactly the same sum of money. And like, you know, I'll use a round figure just for the sake of an easy argument. If that was 100,000, dollars per person, then if you didn't have debt, you'd get 100000 in cash. Uh, if you did have debt, you'd pay debt by $100,000. So it doesn't matter whether you bought an asset or not, you get exactly the same benefit in terms of the impact of that government uh, money creation on your net equity. And that's, that's, that's directly addressing the moral hazard issue. And it's also part of trying to get away from this mentality of uh, borrow and speculate, which is, no, Jeremy Hunt has not already done the debt jubilee. Uh, there's been some debt forgiveness in America, but nothing like a debt jubilee. No, absolutely. The way you've defined it is extremely creative, very distinctive and very different. But, you know, your, your point is it's not actually creating a moral hazard. Hmm. I actually recommend people to look at, I was going to show, if I can show this book here, this is by a colleague of mine. Uh, he is a, um, he was a very successful banker. I won't, he's probably a billionaire, he won't tell me. But this is a book by a guy, an ex-banker, now called The Case for a Debt Jubilee. Mm. Now, Richard's case is, is more traditional in some senses than what I'm proposing. But we would very definitely be addressing the equity problem by saying the debt jubilee would create an identical amount of money for everybody, whether they were, had borrowed money or not. Okay, thank you for that. That's um, cleared that one up. The other one, a uh, small topic just, you know, as we fade into the, uh, into the night. Um, international relations, U.S., and China, right? Um, we seem to be veering dramatically towards the US, you know, defense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, every, everything that China gave us in terms of economic momentum is being sort of, you know, cast uh, in a different light now. Economic threats, political threats, even threats of war. So what's the, what's the uh, New Liberals' philosophy in international relations and specifically our relationship with US and with China? I think that, for starters, um, we really do have to condemn the government here. Um, I don't think you could do more things wrong, you know, um, rattle sabres at, at the most populous nation on earth, the, most, the, the fastest growing economy on earth, um, um, take, take, take a side with the... With, with it, yes, a traditional ally or allies, but in a way that that um, puts it right up the Chinese. Um, man, just as a sideline, let's let's annoy, let's completely annoy the French president, and you know, like they the, the, they they're like they're like diplomatic clodhoppers, and and it's not surprising. You've got Peter Dutton, who is you know now running the defence portfolio. Um, we're very close to coming out with a, with a foreign policy on China at the moment, and it's being crafted by one of our, our senior policy advisor on foreign affairs, Dr. Richard Hames. And Richard uh, is a man who you may know, Martin, advises heads of state around the world and, and leaders of industry. He spent a lot of time living in China, advising uh, very high-level Chinese officials. It's his view that, that China is doing such a great job winning over large parts of the world with their Belt and Road 
um, and their surveillance mechanisms that they have absolutely no need to um, invade anybody. Now, if that's the case, uh, then Australia's sabre rattling is to no end, to no good end other than to, um, you know, uh, destroy our trade relationships with one of our largest trading partners. So, I mean, by and large, we would say let's do diplomacy like diplomats do it, like let's use diplomats, not people like Peter Dutton, um, and sure, let's build an Australian-based defence policy, but let's not make it an either-or between the United States and China. And what does that achieve? It's this dichotomy that modern politician loves the dichotomy. It's got to be one extreme or the other. I don't think it has to be. With a little intelligence brought to bear, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, intelligence. Now, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> but but, but, but the, the, point, the point is... What I think you're getting to is there has to be a subtlety in our yeah. international relations policy. It can't be uh, just a polarization yeah. of everything U.S. good, everything China bad, or yeah. or something else. And my worry, you know, speaking it independently, is that we seem to have got ourselves closer and closer and closer into the U.S. bucket every time, because that's the easy route, and there's perhaps some votes in it for some people, but it doesn't necessarily do Australia well in terms of positioning for its own future. No, that's right. And I think it's a... De look, e either this government is, is totally stupid or it's, it's just a strategy. You know, it's just a, another variation on the oldest political strategy in the world. Get the people frightened um, by something that you create and then tell them that you will be their saviour from that fear. And I, I think that's probably what they're doing. I hope it's that and, and not that they're just total plot <laughs> offers. <laughs> well, you know, I've often said it's either the cock-up theory of history or the conspiracy theory of history, right? I have a feeling that cock-up actually is probably more in vogue than many people would <laughs> uh, want to believe. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, well, we're coming close to the end, but I've just got time for one quick question. Central bank digital currency, good thing, bad thing? Oh, go, Steve. OK, I want to have a central bank digital currency implemented. Uh, so every Australian uh, resident over the age of 18 has a bank account at the central bank. It's not because uh, we necessarily need it straight away, but I want to have a means that we can get people the money money or whatever is necessary into people's accounts rapidly. And simply creating a central bank digital currency is a way to do that. There are dangers in doing that, actually having it as a deposit account, because then uh, people, you, you could break down the liability side of the private banks, and that could be dangerous. You know, I'm quite aware of the dangers there. But I would want the facility. And so constructing that would be something I'd be very happy to tell the RBA to go and do. So that's one case I'd definitely get them to outsource it because I know they put their database together and I'm not going to have anything that bad running as a digital <laughs> currency for this country. Okay, and just I to... I don't care how good they are, they Excel macros. They're not going to use Excel macros for a digital bank account. Sorry. <laughs> right, and just to be clear, we're talking here about a retail level central bank digital currency, right? Because effectively... Sorry? It, it's a retail... A central bank digital currency. Yeah, everybody, there would be no outlets, but everybody yep. would have a bank account, yep. which would be like the, your private bank accounts right now. Mm. Um, and wouldn't this, for example, if we go back to the uh, to the uh, financial crisis of 2008, that could have been the means by which Rudd put a thousand dollars in the hands of everybody who um, who paid. Uh, you got the, the the government stimulus, just a faster way to go about doing it. Absolutely. Well, uh, we've pretty much come to the end of, uh, of our time. Once again, it's gone very, very quickly, and I haven't really covered all the questions. But nevertheless, some very interesting um, uh, comments. Uh, um, Steve, do you want to go with a final set of uh, observations first, and then I'll handle, uh, hand back to Victor to, to finish off the, uh, the conversation? Well, I think people can tell when they're looking at us, we're, in, we're into two things, honesty and realism, not three, and integrity. And what we find is a lack of all three in the current government system. So we will come in with policies which are 
left of field only because the field itself is tilted far too far too far to the right and has a whole bunch of myths about how they manage the economy rather than real knowledge of how the economy actually functions. And with that, we'd be trying to build a, a decent, fair society, not the extreme you know, society of inequality that we have now. And we need something which is going to be resilient for climate change. So that means much more uh, domestic um, uh, manufacturing capability, building up a, a manufacturing base, not in the face of nonsense comparative advantage, but the need to be able to produce for your own people when it's vital and you can't get those goods from overseas. So we're trying to rebuild Australia, reconstruct Australia. It would be a major part of our agenda. Thanks, Steve. Victor? Uh, I think Steve has really nailed it there. I mean, that, that's a, a beautiful summary of what we hope we're about, if I may say so. I guess all I'd want to add to that is that at an even more fundamental level, certain basic human needs have been forgotten uh, without looking at any of the details of, of policy um, and the application of policy. What's been forgotten is compassion, justice and equality of opportunity. Um, and when I'm talking to people, when I'm campaigning in the electorate that I'm standing for of North Sydney, um, and a lot of those people are or were Liberal Party supporters, and, I, and my way of explaining who we are to them is to say simply we are what's often called a small L Liberal Party, um, and that is, that is a, a, a party that believes in the fundamental principles of liberalism, compassion, justice and equality of opportunity. Um, and I, I'm finding a lot of nodding heads when I go about the electorate saying that. So I think Steve, Steve gave the details. I'm just giving you the underpinnings of where we're coming from in a sort of emotional, uh, uh, an emotional philosophical sense. Yeah, and uh, I just want to underscore that, that you know, these, your, your views and the way you've articulated them show genuine concern for individuals and businesses and communities and a real understanding of the way that the sausage is currently being made by the main parties and the fact that we can't go on making the sausage like that if we're actually to thrive as an economy, as a community, as individuals and businesses. So the, the time for change, right, it, it's, it's absolutely is now. And actually is now. the foundations seem to me to be in place to really drive that perhaps more yeah. than ever before. And the, the worse it gets for the main parties and the, the more they dance together and the, the, the more they just go on the old world, the more it leaves the opportunity open for a different voice and one yep. that's actually grounded in logic, economy, you know, economics and those sorts of things. And that's why I'm very happy to give, give, give you time on the channel here and, and time with the community because I think some of the things that you're exploring and talking about are just so, so important. So I want to say thank you to both of you for sharing your thoughts and uh, you know, answering the questions on, on the chat. Um, we haven't got through all of them, but we got through quite a few, which is good. And um, uh, maybe we can do it again sometime because uh, I think some of the things we've touched on tonight are really, really important. Well, we'd love to, and and we'd really like to thank you, Martin, for giving us the opportunity to um, to put our side of the story out there. Very welcome, and uh, thanks to Steve. Thanks, Victor. Uh, I'm going to say cheers. I'm going to take you offline, and I'll just close the show, and uh, we'll uh, pick up the conversation in some way down the track. Thank you both. Well, thank, thank you, you, Martin. So there you go, a uh, very interesting conversation. Thank you for all the questions. Sorry I didn't get to all of them, but uh, hopefully we got a good selection there. And uh, thank you for all of the uh, conversations in the chat as well. Um, just to explain that uh, there will be a show next week as normal. Um, uh, we, I've got um, Leif van Onselen coming on. He's the macro business guy, um, also involved in, of course, some uh, nucleus wealth as well. And we're going to talk about another lost decade ahead. He's obviously looking at the Australian economy, what's happened with housing and uh, finance and all those things. They're going to publish a report and we're going to get some very early insights into that report next week, 21st of December. And so uh, that's next Tuesday. So mark your diaries and come on and share your thoughts for that show too. It'll definitely be worthwhile. And I will just say, uh, just so that everyone is clear, um, I do have 
as you know, my personal situation with my wife, she's very close to the ends now, so my uh, productivity with regard to videos may be a bit uh, limited over the next uh, few days. However, I do make a, a thing of these live streams because I think this is a really important and distinctive contribution that I can help make to what's going on. And as I said a few times, I do this because I care about Australia and Australians and what's going on. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your time tonight and um, again thanks to, to Victor and thanks to Steve. I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, this is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. See you later.